All right, hey folks, today I'm gonna to be talking to you about optimal training frequency. Um, what's the best frequency for muscle gains? Uh, all right, so before that, thanks for making it onto my channel. Um, I would appreciate any likes, any comments down below. And also, if you are a regular viewer here, consider hitting the bell notification to get a notification whenever I release a video. That would mean that you make sure you don't miss anything. That would mean a lot. All right, folks, let's get on with this. So optimal training frequency, I'm gonna outline to you, first of all, a problem that we have with current research and then highlight some of the solutions that I see towards that and just some things that you need to be aware of. So let's crack on with the day. So firstly, a summary of the issue. Now, for roughly the past decade or so, most research has pointed to a trend of higher frequencies producing more hypertrophy with two being better than one, three being better than two, and some influencers have gone beyond that as well. Like I know Menno Henselmans, he uh, likes frequencies of six to seven days a week of training with very high volumes. So these are a couple of um, quotes pulled from 2015 and 2016 studies, which I'm gonna read out. When comparing studies that investigated training muscle groups between one to three days per week on a volume equated basis, the current body of evidence indicates that frequencies of training twice a week promote superior hypertrophic outcomes to once a week. And just lastly, the findings suggest that's potentially superior hypertrophic benefit to higher weekly resistance training frequencies. So both things which suggest, you know, it's probably better to do more in terms of frequency than less. So if you have been active for the last, say, five or 10 years, and you were one of those guys who were who had bought into this hypertrophy research, let's say you're 25, you're a 25 year old PT and you're out there, or let's say you're 30 and you're a regular gym goer and you've been going to the gym for a while and all the local PT has been telling you is, you gotta train a muscle group twice a week or three times a week for maximum gains. And you're like, oh, but Arnold said, <laughs> and you're thinking some other guy, some really jacked guy in the gym has been doing bro splits and he's been making a lot more progress than you, but you are just pigeonholed into this two or three times a week and you don't really like it, but it's what the science wants to do, wants you to do. And all that you're being told is you gotta train at least twice a week, preferably more for the greatest hypertrophy results. Now, what if that's you? Well, we had another update from Brad in 2019. This <laughs> quite clearly said that actually it doesn't matter. It's irrelevant. The hypertrophy research is now pointing, you know, at least in 2019, was pointing to this idea that actually all that stuff that we thought in 2015 and 2016 was actually false. And new data and new research, we're looking at things in a new way, has confirmed that actually, you know what, what we thought all along, it doesn't actually matter. Like, sure, Jay Cutler was right, so is Ronnie Coleman. So was Arnold Schwarzenegger. So were a bunch of bodybuilders over the last 70 years who trained the muscle maybe once a week, sometimes twice a week. They were all right because it actually, as long as you do enough work, it doesn't really matter. Now, the interesting thing about this is at the time this was released, I specifically remember the discussions on Reddit and a lot of people refused to believe it. They were so indoctrinated into the meta-analysis and research from the mid 2015s and 2016s, they didn't even wanna hear this new stuff. So. I mean, you can imagine what it's like if you are a PT with very limited experience. Let's say you, that you're, you're currently, I don't know, 25, 26, 27. And this new research comes in and your entire training life has just been this research because you don't really have much experience because you're a PT. You're only, I don't know, 25 to 30, whatever. You don't have a great deal of experience on you. All you have is the research. So you're not actually evidence-based. You're just one of those mongoloids who just looks at the research all the time. <laughs> you don't have anything else. And so this would just completely blow you apart. So a lot of people actually refused to acknowledge the work and they just said, no, Brad, actually, I refuse to believe it. To which, you know, Brad was met with disbelief. Brad himself just thought, well, this doesn't make any sense. But it, you can see how people thought that. Now, Brad then dropped another clangor and he said this, this is the interaction with him and Paul Carter from Lift Run Bang. He said, I love this one and the meta-analysis that shows when volume is equated, there's no benefit in training a muscle group uh, muscle, multiple times a week. After years of natty bros making fun of bro splits. So 
Paul's always done a bro split and um, he's done very well on that. And Brad followed that up with more research coming soon showing split routines are at least as effective, if not more so than total body routines is what the end of the quote says. So <laughs> Brad now drops his clangor. He, he says, wow, but actually, you know what? Bro splits may well have been optimal all along. So for me, this is a little bit like the um, BCAA research back in the early 2000s. Like it's not as morally questionable, sure, but it's equally as misleading. Like for those people who have just been so indoctrinated as to believe that the two or three times a week muscle frequency is the best, well, their reaction when this new research came out was of just disbelief. They just couldn't believe it. They were like, no, I refuse to believe it. It must be wrong. And it's like the BCA things. I mean, you know, you mentioned BCAs now and you met with crickets, but what if you were one of the guys evangelizing BCAs back then? Like, how would you feel now and spending all that extra money? So Brad sort of tries to pull this all together um, by saying that the best applied research comes from the field. Thus, research will always be catching up with what bodybuilders do in practice. The goal of science is actually to just objectively test the validity of those practices. So in a way, um, bodybuilding research, hypertrophy research is very dissimilar to research in other fields. Like research in fields of say, I'll give you a stark example, which everyone is familiar with, like cancer research, for example, right? We don't, it's, that's all exploratory research. We don't know, you know, how to fix it that issue. We are pouring in lots of money to try and fix what is a very relevant issue for a lot of people, right? Hypertrophy, growing muscles, we know how to do it. Like all we're doing with the research is we're cross-checking it. That's all. We are not finding new ways of doing of growing muscles. Possibly the only one thing that we have found, which is technically new, might you might say is blood flow, blood flow restriction training, but that's about it. So in general, none of Apart from BFR training, none of the rest of it is really finding out what else is new, what works. We know what works. We know from 70 years in the field what works. Arnold Schwarzenegger back in the 60s and 70s knew what worked. Vince Garanda back in the 40s and 50s knew what worked. Even George Hackenschmidt back in the 20s knew what worked. So we know what works. This is not, this is retrospective research. We are just trying to figure out precisely the minutiae of what works. So it's always important to remember that when you're looking at the latest hypertrophy research, match it with what actually works in the field, in the gym in this case. And on that note, I'll just say, you know, to be truly evidence-based, you have to match together the research with what you know works. So if you are that 25-year-old PT fresh out of university and all he knows is research, you are not yet evidence-based because you don't have the experience to be evidence-based. Evidence-based culminates experience with the research and the um, patient experience, in this case, your clients. So it's important to bear that in mind. So where does this leave us? One, to be truly evidence-based, understand you've got to match together. You have gotta marry together the evidence with the actual research and then with what the client wants. And also understand that science is working things out retrospectively. We are cross-checking. We are sifting through the minutia to see what really works and what doesn't. Frequency is one of those minutia. So to have a strong opinion on it, to have such a strong opinion to say that bro splits are useless, and I've heard people say that, to have such a strong opinion on it to say that bro splits are useless and all bodybuilders are dumb because of that is a very misguided and naive thing to say. And I've heard plenty of people say that. Anything which looks vastly different from what bodybuilding is probably isn't bodybuilding. Like, for example, there was a famous article years ago, uh, which was entitled um, Why CrossFit is Better at Building Muscle than Bodybuilding, which is the stupidest thing I've ever heard in a long time. But it was a very popular article because people wanted to believe that. Put together, um, I think if you put together anything in a, in a relatively convincing way, people there's going to be a certain subset of people who are going to believe it. But Understand that the best applied research comes from the field. Arnold wasn't doing CrossFit type workouts to build mass simply because they're not the most efficient thing to build mass. Do you guys get what I'm trying to say? 
research is great and I'm very evidence-based myself. I have a lot of experience and I really look at the research, but to be evidence-based, you have to actually have experience as well. It's part and parcel of it. Brad himself was a bodybuilder. He competed, he knows these things. So in terms of the bottom line on optimal training frequency, the bottom line is that when volume is equated, it's highly likely frequency comes down to a matter of preference. Volume seems to be an important part of it. Mechanical tension, as we know, is the prime driver of growth. Volume does seem to be a strong component of that. Um, we certainly know we can't boil it down to one set, for example. Generally, there is a reason why bodybuilders tend to do a reasonable number of sets reasonably hard. However, in terms of the frequency, for now, that remains up in the air. At least that's where we are now. There might be further evidence coming to to us in the future, but I just kind of want to, I just sort of want to end with a conclusion here to say that you've to be to be truly evidence based, you've got to actually look at all things. You've got to look at the practical experience. You've got to look at the research. But please don't let any one research article, even if it's a meta analysis, dissuade you from doing things which you know work for you. So, bottom line, I think what's probably more useful is having ways to check to see whether your training is working, like objective markers of improvement, for example, pictures, measurements, strength increases, visible objective things like that, which are going to help you understand what works and what doesn't for you as an individual. And not jumping onto every latest hype train, whether that's the latest article from, I don't know, Cali Muscle or whoever other inane influencer there is out there, or equally as much the latest research article. All right, folks, hopefully that was a clear enough message. If you've got this far, um, please do subscribe if you haven't done so already. Like the video, leave some comments down below. Let me know what you think. Uh, what is your optimal training frequency? Take it easy. All right.